This is Janice. And I'm Sarah N. And we're your hosts for Explore This, a podcast for the modern day working professional. Each week, we explore actionable insights on how you can thrive personally and professionally. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Explore This podcast. We're here back in the studio, and we have the privilege today of having Dato Sri Idris Jala on the pod today. Dato Sri, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So Dato Sri Idris Jala is no stranger to most Malaysians. Now best known for being a transformation guru in driving performance both in the government as well as the private sector, he is currently the chairman of Pemandu Associates. On top of his role in Pemandu, Dato Sri Idris Jala also currently serves as a non-executive co-chairman of Sunway Group, the chairman of Heineken Malaysia as well as the pro-chancellor of Sunway University. And of course, prior to Pemandu, Dato Sri Idris was also the CEO of Malaysia Airlines and also held various senior positions in Shell for more than 20 years. So long list of accolades there, Dr. Sri. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot that I didn't even manage to get into. That's but right. we're very happy to have you on the show and in the studio with us today. Thank you for Absolutely. making the time. A real pleasure to be here with both of you. Dr. Sri, we're really excited to hear more about your journey and some you know, life lessons that you can speak to us about. But to start off, Let's wind back the clock and talk about your childhood. We know that you had a very unique upbringing in the jungles of Borneo and that this phase of life has had a very significant impact on who you are as a person. Can you share with us what it was like growing up in that environment? You know, what was the social context? How was it like economically? And how did growing up in the environment shape you to be who you are today? I was really born and uh, I grew up in, in the jungle of Borneo in a very small, very remote village called Barrio. I was very close to the Kalimantan border and we were very poor, but I never felt poor because nobody else in the village had more. So we all had the same stuff. And so I think poverty is a relative thing. And when I look back at it since that time, I never felt deprived because no one else had anything more than we did. So poverty, I never felt poor, though we were poor. Uh, My father was a teacher. He set up many schools, opened up many schools there. He taught me one important lesson when I was a kid. There's a term that he used called katui. It's a, the word katui is a climate language for, in Hokkien, it's uh, kiasu. <laughs> and so he basically, by the way, kiasu is now in the Oxford English Dictionary. Wow, is it? It's a hate to lose. Whereas katui in my dialect, my, my dad said it, it also, it means burning desire to win. So if either if you had to lose or you have a burning desire to win, the consequence is the same, which means you take extreme measures. And so my dad, he really taught me that idea that if you really want to succeed in life, you have to have that quality of being katwi. And that was the thing that, that drum he drummed into me as a kid, as I grew up in that village. But the other interesting thing was, At the time when I was a boy, and uh, we had the Indonesian confrontation. Some of you listeners who know a bit of the history, we had a conflict with Indonesia. So the British soldiers were in my village. Wow. And they were the SAS soldiers who came there, protect us from the Indonesians. And they used to watch movies. And when they watched movies in the the open field, they had barbed wires all around. And then we used to watch movies. We couldn't enter the the barbed wire field, to watch the movies. but So we watched the movies from the other side of the screen. Much later in life, I was wondering many years later when I went to town, I was wondering how come Elvis Presley was (laughs) left-handed because we were watching the movie from the other side. The point about that movie, as we saw the movies, was this. The soldiers told us there was a world beyond the mountain. And that world is real. And if you want to see that world, the only passport to see that world is to pass your exam. So I read so many books that were there, and I really devoured as many of the books in our small collection library. I wanted to see that world beyond the mountain. And to me and my my friends who were studying, failing the exam was like consigning yourself to death. Wow. Because how dare you, you know, don't go and see that world beyond the mountain the one we've seen in the movie, the one we see in the books. So really studying was absolutely like life and death. And so that was the reason why I think many of us who came through that cohort, many of the kids did very well. 
We had magistrates, we have lawyers today, we have engineers, name it there. We have PhDs, lecturers, associate professors from the little cohort, from that little town because of the desire to see the world beyond the mountain. And that was, for me, it was really a very important thing. Of course, when, when we went to town, the world wasn't quite the same as the one in the movie. Yeah? Of course. <laughs> that was a context. Poor, but never felt poor. Education was the ticket to see the world beyond the mountain, the curiosity to want to see that world. And my dad, who taught me this idea of being katui, that means kiasula, and really that's in everything that you do. Wow. And, and, you know, I'm sure that's translated into not only just your upbringing, but, you know, bringing you out into the world that you actually know of it now. Yeah. And you've, we've heard you speak so much about the idea of finding your true north. Yeah. And as we have shared with you on the podcast and even in our earlier conversations, you know, audience for the Explore This podcast, you know, that individuals like Janice and myself, that's something that we are always finding and discovering and, you know, having that burning desire to, yeah, yeah. to find it. It feels almost like it's this... um you know, North Star that, that you, you, you know it's out there. Yeah. You don't know if you'll actually find it. And I think it also resonates with the word purpose. Yeah, yeah. So with the story of your childhood from Barrio and where you are today, what was your discovery of your personal North Star? Yeah, this, uh, the true North idea is, is, a, is a thing that evolved over time. But you'll find when I trace through my life, there are two very important memorable events that took place really turned, uh, if you like, turned the corner for me. Yeah? And let me begin by defining what, why I consider this idea of true north so important is this. You will never excel in life unless you are very clear about what you want to do. And not only are clear about what you intend to do, it becomes the anchor for how you prioritize. No champions, Olympic champion, become an Olympic champion if you want to run Every race, you can. You have to choose a few disciplines. And then you focus your effort, you focus on energy on doing that. So if you're clear about your true north, then you're clear about prioritization. The word prioritization is the, one of the biggest bastardized words in the English language. Because most people say, oh, that's important. The next day, they say, that's also important. But actually, the word prioritization is it's important to say what you are not going to do. Because they are everything you want to do. But we don't have time and resources to do that. So true north is a very important idea of anchoring your life upon. And so for me, there were two very important episodes that really turned the corner for me. One was in 1973, when I went through a period when I became reborn as a Christian. I was born in a Christian family. We had the Barrio Revival in 1973. I remember it very, very well. That was a very important time. Why was that important? Because when I accepted Christ as my Savior, Jesus, when he left earth, he said to his disciples, when I leave you, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will live within you. This idea, when God promised that God lives within us, it says in Luke chapter 1, 37, with God, nothing is impossible. So picture the idea if God lives within you, and if you really believe it, you can do many things. Not because you can do it, because God that lives within you allows you to do it. So that's a very important idea that happened to me in 1973 during revival. And that's a very big thing that shaped my life. Subsequent to that, way back in 1998, I was posted as the managing director for Shell in Sri Lanka. And I was a relatively young guy and I wanted to change the world. I wanted to do so many things. When I went there, then I realized that there's so many things I did not know what to do. And literally we had strikes. Our selling price was controlled by the government. The selling price was lower than product cost. So we could not make any money. There's no way we could make money. And the company was losing money for more than 20 years. So when I went there, we had strike that took my transport manager hostage. They planted bomb at our depot. I tell you, at that point, I was totally on my knees. I, my wife had panic attack and she couldn't breathe. And so there I was, a relatively young guy, impressionable fellow, wanted to see uh, conquer the world. I was on my knees. I completely surrendered. I didn't know what to do. That was when I started to pray. 
and ask God, said, look, I will do the best I can, but this is an insurmountable. There was nothing in the shell manual that tells us how to deal with somebody taken ransom. Nothing in the manual that tells me how to deal with the bomb planted under our depot. We had 1,800 metric tons of gas in four spheres. And if the bomb had, bomb had detonated, it would be an explosion that is so big, anyone that lived within four kilometers radius would have died. So it was a massive issue that I had to tackle, strikes that we were having as well. No playbook for that. That's when I, I felt the idea of kneeling down and praying to God. And my wife was having a panic attack. And so it was a very, very difficult moment. And it was the turning point that that moment onwards, I started to do things that were totally unconventional outside the things that I was taught in school. I was taught in, in the normal shell work. And that was, for me, it was a very big, I call it the, uh, the period of real testing by fire. And that's when I understood what it meant by being completely ruthless about prioritization. Wow. And Based on the true north. Mm, I see, I see. What was one, you know, if you could think of the biggest lesson that, that sort of your time at Shell, what do you learn from that experience? What I learned from the experience is two things. That means I don't know all the answers, but I have to, as the leader of the, the company, I must be clear about setting the direction, the true north. And so I, my lesson learned is that if you are clear about your true north, if you can visualize what it looks like, then you can know what you're going to do in the present to achieve that. You must visualize it. So you have to sit down and say, it is the year X and X, that means five years from today. This is what I see. This is the profit we're making. This is the number of customers that we were doing this. This is the accolade that we get from the customers about our service. This is, this is what the expansion of the business would look like. Visualize it. Because the idea of visualization is the thing that draws you into the present. That means you manage, you, you are, you're standing in the, in the future to manage the present. Most conventional thinking is about standing in the present to go to the future. But you need to be in the future to manage the present. You are too young to know about this movie called Back to the Future. Oh, oh we know. Oh, yeah. so that, that's a, that's <laughs> a movie. That the idea of the power is in the future. The power is in the true north. The power does not lie in the present. So the idea of inspiring yourself to see that world that inspires you to say, I have seen the promised land. So if you have seen the promised land, you want to go there, the land of milk and honey. And if you haven't visualized it, you wouldn't have the power to be drawn into it. So that was a very big idea. But of course, when you start doing that, the big lesson learned for me, or the second lesson learned was to set that idea, that, that, that future, to be the game of the impossible. That's a very big lesson learned. Why is that so important is this. If you consign yourself to achieve normal targets, you don't need to. You just do normal business to achieve that target. If I ask you, increase your sales by 10%, no transformation is required because you can achieve 10% increase in sales by doing yeah, business as usual. But if I say in one year, I want you to increase sales by 500%, you know you cannot do it based on your current way of doing it. You have to fundamentally go through a real transformation process. So that is a lesson learned in Sri Lanka, setting the goal to be an impossible goal. And if you put it so high, that promised land, and what you really out there, it really forced you to transform and it forced the organization to transform. Those were the key things that were picked up from that experience. And uh, I, a lot of things has happened in the meantime, and I will not we'll go into detail if you want to. Yeah, surely very formative times, you know, during your whole Shell experience. Because in 20, 2005, you went on to Malaysia Airlines, which is our flagship national carrier, and became its CEO during its worst financial period in its 50-year history. And you were given a mammoth task to turn it around, right? Eventually, we know that um, it did turn around. You produced $260 million profit in just 24 months. But we want to go back to that time where, you know, it's you in the office, this big file comes to your desk, and it is seemingly very, very impossible. 
to turn it around. It was bleeding cash. There were a lot of culture issues. We want to understand what were the biggest challenges and issues that you had to deal with immediately and what were some of the thoughts that went through your mind the moment you were given this task? When you go into a company that's in dire strait in a crisis, the first thing you observe is that the organization is defeated. So if they are defeated, you just have to bring hope. So if you don't bring hope, the idea of that Obama calls the audacity of hope, you must bring hope. And if you want to bring hope, you must know what is that promised land. So I went and then painted the picture of the promised land to them. So I remember I, I turned at my office at 7.45 a.m. If you look through the newspaper, you see a photograph of me right there on the front page of the NST. At, at the crack of dawn was the article taken by, I think the Star was a road article. I went to the office 7.45 to find out who, where my office was, who my secretary was, because I had booked a board meeting at 8 o'clock. And so at 8 o'clock, I had a board meeting and I presented to the board, this is what we plan to do. This is the impossible target that we intend to achieve. And uh, after that, then I went to see the Minister of Transport. I went straight to uh, Pr uh, Putrajaya. And then Minister of Finance. And then the Prime Minister. That was on the sa same morning. Then I came back to the office. I had a meeting with the management team. That's in the afternoon at 2 o'clock. At 4 o'clock, I had a town hall meeting with the whole staff. And I said to them the idea of the promised land. And it was an impossible target. Let me tell you, how did I conquer the fear of failure? Some of you may want to know. If you set a tall target like that, how do you conquer the fear of failure? The first thing you need to do is to pray to God. That's what I did at home. The second thing was, I have a conversation for action to conquer the fear of failure. This is how it goes. I said to the board, this is a target. Do you think this is possible to achieve? They look at me and said, very, very difficult. And maybe the chairman said, maybe impossible to achieve in that time. That's good. They said. And then I asked them the question, is it worthwhile to go for that target? Is it okay to, for me and the team to pursue it? Of course. Then the next comment I make to them is, since you say it's impossible to achieve, and you say it's worthwhile for me and my team to chase it, if we fail, it's okay, isn't it? <laughs> of course. Very clever. Yeah, I've given us some leeway. So, but I did mm. tell them, but we will have a realistic target upon which I will be held accountable to. So we have a normal target, then we have an Olympics target, impossible target. So that why it's important to have a two-tier target, then you conquer the fear of failure. Because if you just have one target called the impossible target, Nobody would want to put their neck on the chopping mm. block. Oh, yeah. Correct. Do it. But you tell them, mm -hmm. this is the target that's normal. If I don't get this target, you can dismiss me, you can sack me. But if, I, if we achieve, but frankly speaking, we're going for the Olympics target. That's what we will do. And this is the whole idea of getting people to bring people through a conversation for action to conquer the fear of failure. And then you have the two-tier target. So these are the things that you really need to do. But notice my, my approach always is first day in the job, town hall session. It, not the second day, not the third day. And that's always my approach. When I was in Shell, I did exactly the same thing. What do I do on the first day? Paint the idea, describe to them promised land, describe to them the impossible target, and say, I don't know all the answers. We're going to work out the answers together. But I can tell you what is the thing we're trying to get. And normally I tell them, the way to find the answers together is to run lab. That will gather people from interdisciplinary marketing, sales people, we, put the, we lock them in the room to all together for six weeks. And we put in the PNL, profit and loss statement, put it in front of them, marketing, sales, operations, technical people, IT and HR people, and say, this is the problem, find answers, in the next six weeks so that we can solve all these problems, so that we know exactly where we're heading. That was what we do. Six weeks, not six months, six weeks. That's all that's needed. In trying to bring people together, to create labs, to kind of condense that process of fast results, right? What are some of the common challenges you might face in terms of people and their sort of attitude or reactions to that? The first thing is you, they'll tell you, 
oh, you're going to give me the put the best and the brightest in the room. For six weeks, the departments will collapse. You take them a BAU, you are right? Taking the thing, yeah. You're taking them from there and keeping them in the room. Who's going to run the business? Mm -hmm. That's what they say. Yeah. But you know what I found? Every time we pull the best people out from their job into the labs, the work functions probably better than when they were not even there. Why do you think that's the case? The reason is this. People are always at their best when they're back against the wall. So you have to trust people. You have to tell them, look, I am going to away for six weeks. I'm trusting you to go and do this. And I find that time and again, regardless of where we did this work, people are at the best when the back's against the wall. Some of you remember when we were in university, we only study intensely two weeks before the exams. Truth. Yeah. Back's against the wall. The exam time is there. Crunch time. Crunch time. You really have to do it. So we're telling people, we're taking the best and brightest inside the lab. We're leaving you for six weeks to run the show. And, and we always find that's a very big resistance even before you assemble people. And the second thing is that they'll tell you, oh, we've done that before. It didn't work. But when, we, when they always say we've done that before, it didn't work. It was because they were doing it in solo, in silo. Each department is doing their own. But you say, no, 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 no. We're doing it together this time around as a team. You're not going in disparate rooms. You're figuring out what to do. But this is a collective solution that we're going to come out with doing it. So I find the idea of bringing people together and convening them to work together to solve the problem, then you find solutions, incredible solutions to everything that we were doing. It's amazing. We call it Hotel California, the lab. <laughs> oh. In a six weeks, we tell them the motto is, you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. Ooh. Wow. That means you, tonight, when we finish the lab for the day, you go home, but you stay to, you have to return to Hotel California the next day and the next day and the next six weeks. So when we finish that work, we have a very detailed action plan about what to do by name, by date, by activities, resources, very, very detailed so that we know how to track uh, the activities during implementation. On, on the note of playing the game of the impossible, that's those three, you know, one thing that we also noticed is taking this example of mass. At that point of time, you've never had any experience in neither the aviation industry, transportation in general, or even just state-run companies. But, you know, as you've spoken to the fact that there was a tremendous chance of failure, yet the board of directors told you that it's worth pursuing yeah. and also knowing that, okay, there is the you know, goal that you're going to achieve, but there's the bigger Olympic goal, which is what you're going to be striving for. So, you know, with these factors playing against you, essentially, how was the mindset shift internally for yourself before you brought that clarity? Because you always talk, you, you spoke about how, you know, you have to um, help in the town hall that you run, you help the team to see that promised land. But how did you actually gain that clarity for yourself? Yeah, it was prior to... Uh taking on the job, I took a weekend and I told my wife, let's go to Genting, we brought our both sons there and spend the weekend there. It was a kind of retreat, kind of spiritual retreat for us, spending time there. I took one book along with me other than the Bible. This is a book written by Gordon Bethune. He was a CEO of uh, Continental and the, the airline was going through a similar dire strait, a crisis, just like Malaysia Airlines. So that weekend, I read the book chapter and verse. And then the book is called From Worst to First. And so I was totally inspired by what Gordon Bethune has done for Continental. Then I said to myself, everybody else said it cannot be fixed. And I am not an aviation guy. But then I also noticed this guy is also not an aviation man. And if he can do it, I can do it too. So I had the confidence to do it. But prior to joining Malaysia Alliance, I had one thing in my toolkit. And that is this. Every company that loses money, my first starting point is to segment the profit and loss statement to the lowest common denominator. And I still believe to this day, I'm the only CEO of an airline that break down the profit and loss statement of the airline into individual flights. That means we have 110,000 flights in a year. I wanted 110,000 profit and loss statement. 
So when I came into the job, I got the finance di uh, director to sit down in my room. His name is Tanko Azmil. Azmil said, I want to, us to const reconstruct last year's PNL, break them down to every flight that we had last year. How much revenue per flight? How much cost, direct cost per flight? How much overhead do we charge onto this? And then I then brought all of them into separate rooms. This is when we ran the labs. We told them, this is the European labs. We threw the PNL, or all the routes, all the flights to Europe, all the Middle East, this is the flights, all the ones that are North Asia, Southeast, ASEAN, etc., and the kangaroo route. And we told them in six rooms, you look at how to fix this. The true North is to turn around a loss-making company to become profitable by looking at these routes. It's amazing. The answers jump at you as you look. For example, we lose 20 million ringgit flying to London every year. The team looked at the, all the flights to London. Every day, the same two flights made money. Every day, the same two flights lose money. What's the solution? Get rid of those two flights. And some of the other flights that we were losing money flying to Sydney from KL, we lose money to Adelaide as well. And when they examined it, it was very clear the problem was the incoming flights from Europe, they brought the passengers. They were, by the time they arrived, the flights to Sydney had taken off. Those were the passengers we needed to connect. But we were connecting different ones from Middle East. But most of the customers we wanted was the ones from Europe. So what is the solution? Reschedule. That's all. But the answers are very real, you know. And we were making so much money flying to Hong Kong, Taiwan, and also so much money to, to Japan, but we didn't have enough planes. So when you cut out some of the routes, like in Egypt, we just diverted the planes there. So when you, when you put the PNL on the table, I always tell people, the treatment is in the disease. How do you know the disease? By looking at a PNL, at the lowest common denominator. It's not an esoteric, theoretical idea that, you know, oh, let's go, go. No, 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 it's right here. And so when you break it down to the lowest common denominator, by flight, you'll find it too. You know, I mean, take the example of Proton. In Proton, at one time, they wanted to uh, borrow money from the government, 1.5 billion ringgit. And uh, I was minister at that time. And we told them, okay, if you want to borrow it, 1.5 billion, you must accept two conditions. Uh, Idris and the team, I was appointed the chairman of the review committee for, for Proton. Once a week, I turn up in the office and then I will instruct them what to do. And the first thing we told them to do was to do the segmented p &L. After you do that, you'd make the beautif beautify yourself. And we also told them you have to find a partner that they need to marry. La. That's how uh, Gili came into the picture. The interesting thing was when we broke down the PNL by a model of car, they were even shocked to know which model of car was profitable and which was unprofitable. They had no idea that Exora was the most profitable of their, their model. And all the other Saga, they're spending 70% of the assembly line was to produce Saga. Actually, the one that makes them money yeah. is Exora. If they had known that before, what would they have done? they would have spent 70% of the assembly line to produce that. No wonder when Zili took over, what's the first model of car that they sell out? X70. That's the derivative of that because that is a segment that was profitable. If you are, you are here in ASB and you don't have many degrees unlike Sunway, for example, in Sunway University, if you run p &L by program, you know exactly which program gives you the most money. You also know which program gives you the least money. And so if you don't know that, you kind of focus the resources. So to my mind, I always tell people, the treatment is in the disease. The only way you can recognize that is to look at the segmented profit and loss statement. Then you'll figure it out. And so, but that, it comes, it jumps at you straight away. And that's how we started to make all the, uh, the changes in the things that we're doing. And the beauty is this. Once you got the whole team involved in doing it, 
it was them that found the answer. It was them that were committed to implement it. It's them that believe it is the right thing to do. It's not me, the CEO, now I figured out how to do it and I tell you what to do. They have the commitment. It was not the consultants that came from outside that tell them what to do. So the answers are indigenous. The answers is there. The buy-in is there. The commitment to deliver is there. And that's how the power in my mind of assembling people to rally around the segmented PNL and then finding solutions uh, that cure the problem. Mm. Sounds like you gave authority as well as uh, autonomy and ownership to yeah, your team absolutely. to help them with running these labs and discovering yeah. the answers among themselves. Absolutely. And this is really fantastic. And, and I find this idea of putting people in a room like that really telling that this is the new way of working. We, I don't want you to be in your department and then someone, we create a task force. If you do a normal task force, somebody sends a letter to the other department, they wait for a month or so before they reply. And then these people begin to find another reply and they have steering committee meeting and every month they have steering committee meeting. Nothing gets done. But this is big, fast result. In six weeks, we want outcome. And there's no sending emails, no sending uh, uh, letters to its, its department. They're all here. They're all talking to one another. They analyze the data together. They find the problem. They solve it together. It's fantastic. Sounds like you really had a marrying of ingredients of cutting out layers of bureaucracy, Absolutely. cutting out all the unnecessary you know, SOPs in that sense and just getting people together to just work in really, really agile ways. Absolutely. That is a very concrete way of, I think, overcoming that fear of failure as well, right? Tangible actions of having people together brainstorm and getting to the root cause of problems. That's the word, your root cause of the problem. The root cause of the problem is by examining the PNL at the segment uh, PNL level, that level of detail. Mm. If, if, it, if you don't mind me asking, Dr. Yeah. Sri, it seems like so to speak, it's not rocket science, right? That no. you get fundamentally deep down into understanding the common denominator, sure. whatever causes, uh, whatever gives, generates revenue or whatever causes loss. Why is it that people don't start from that starting point? Why, why do people not do that? Because most people look at the PNL as one activity, one item. So if you look at the profit and loss statement of a company, typically you will see one PNL, but nobody break it down. And if they break it down, they break it down not to the lowest common denominator, but they bring it down halfway through. I could say, for example, most airlines in the world have profit and loss statement broken down up to root. That means Kuala Lumpur to London is one root. You aggregate all the flights in a year to produce that PNL for that route. But you went beyond that. We've gone beyond that every individual flight. When you do it at root level, you will conclude that London is unprofitable. What's the solution? Get rid of the whole route. That's bad. But if I went down the route uh, into the PNL individual flight, then I knew that of the four flights every day, two were making money, two were losing money. And then I knew exactly what was the solution. The first solution was the lab said, let's go to London Heathrow and tell them the reason why people don't want this particular flight is because they are. You fly 13 hours on our mass flight, sleeping. When you arrive there very late, in late afternoon, then you're ready to sleep. So people don't like that flight. So that's why the problem was to try to convince London Heathrow Airport to tell them, can we change the slot time so that we arrive at a different time. But Heathrow was crowded. There was no other slot available. So therefore, we couldn't change that. And so that's why you then solution was to get rid of it. Once you get rid of it, immediately. So at that point, the very next day, we were making money. We didn't change the face structure. We didn't change the, the branding. We didn't change Nasi Lama. Everything is the same. So right away, you're making money. You don't have to think twice. And this is the point about, as I said, the solutions stares at you right in the face when you look at it. So man, it sounds that you really have distilled, you know, from your lessons of turnarounds, distilled this into a very tangible science of it that has yeah, led yeah, you yeah. to generate more successful companies. And we do want to explore actually the flip side of success and we want to talk about failures with you, right? Because this is a topic that we speak about quite a lot on the podcast and it does require a certain level of vulnerability. But 
um, I think we believe that being able to grow from failures is a necessary part of yeah, growth absolutely. and personal development. So we would love to hear from you if you could share with us your most defining or memorable failure and setback that you've encountered and what were the lessons that you could take away from that? Very good question. George Washington Cover once said, 99% of failures come from people who have a habit of making excuses. 99%. So I always believe that when I fail in something to do, I don't consider it's a failure. I consider it's free tuition. Mm -hmm. Free tuition. Now you have free tuition. What can I learn from them? What are the new lessons learned? Let me tell you one example of very big failure on my part. When I was in Shell Sri Lanka, we had a situation where the selling price was controlled by the government. We could not sell our product LPG, the cooking gas, above the selling price because Shell was given a monopoly by the government at that time. We bought a company that government owned and we took it lock, stock and barrel. We paid for 51% and the government owned 49 But the problem was the price that was set there was lower than product cost. That means we import our LPG from the ship. By the time they arrived at the port of Colombo, we were already losing money. I haven't taken them off using the bowsers to the plant. We haven't put them in the filling plant. We haven't put them in cylinders. We hadn't done marketing and sales. We were already losing money from, from the port. So the most crazy thing I did was I told all my marketing and sales people, please don't come to work. Because the more you sell, the more, it's, the more we lose. So please don't sell. I pay you full salary, but you stay home. Because I understood the PL. If I, you understand the PNL, you start to do crazy things, but I was not mad. That is crazy thing to tell people, you are marketing and sales, you stay at home, I pay your salary, please don't work. People think I'm crazy, I'm not mad, because I understood the reason why we were making so much losses and we're burning cash. And so I told them, I'll pay you full salary, but please don't come to work. I knew what is the solution. The whole solution was to talk to the government about raising the price. To cut a long story short, there were many things that we did there. But this is what they told me. They said, look, uh, Idris, we agree that you will have one, one immediate uh, increase in price, uh, but not the full amount. But we do it in stages. But this has to be done this way. And they had observed, because they used to run the company, you know, 13 kg cylinder, the international safety standard is that you must not fill the 13 kg cylinder with 13 kg LPG. You must only fill 12.5. That means enough space called alleged for expansion. When the heat comes and then they can expand, you don't have an explosion. So they told us the company currently is not complying with the safety standard. So we want you to just drop the quantity of the LPG in the cylinder to 12.5 but keep the price concerned. But you cannot tell everybody. So they say to me, that's your price increase. Instead of increasing the price, keep the price constant, but lower the content. That's your first price increase. Then I said, okay, if your government said that's the thing to do, then I was found out. The whole of Sri Lanka was a bust. There was a newspaper. Of, they put a photograph of me on the front page of the Sunday Leader the lie within Shell. And so that was a public ignominy for me because if you are the managing director of a company that's supposed to be reputable and now you're doing something that's considered unethical, that's a very big lesson. And that is lesson learned from me. From that moment onward, what was the lesson learned? From then on, I had come up with this idea that every ethical issues that I have to handle with Ethics is in the gray area as opposed to black and white. Black is the things that are wrong and you shouldn't be doing, corrupt. White is the thing right and proper to do. Gray is the thing that requires your ethics. I have three things that I, I learned from it, the lesson learned. Number one, I never decide ethical issues alone by myself because it's my conscience. One, conscience not good enough. I must bring it to 10 people in the room at least. The whole board must discuss this. The whole management team must discuss this so that there are more concerns involved. 
in dealing with this ethical issue. Number two, we must write down all the facts of the case on a piece of paper and the options available to us and justify why option C is better than A and B. Number three, this is the most important one. It's called the litmus test. If we do what we said we will do under option C, and if this document is leaked in the social media, can I defend my action, yes or no? Obviously, if I did the three steps, obviously it would have been clear that what I was doing wasn't the right thing to do because I cannot defend in a public domain. It's indefensible to go and tell public that you keep the price there, I'm lowering the thing without t telling people. But I couldn't do that because the government had said you can't go and announce a price increase because it's very unpopular. We're going through a, a presidential election. That's what they told me. So I could not tell them. I couldn't even defend myself. So when they were hitting me, I couldn't say the reason why we did was because the government told me to do this. I couldn't even say that too. That's many years ago. I can tell the story today. But that was the lesson learned. I learned three things and I documented them. Today, I teach them as well about how to handle ethics on those three points. That was a lesson learned. So as George Washington Cover once said, 99% of failures come from people who have a habit of making excuses. I had made no excuses for the mistake I made there, and I only took them as free tuition. And that is the key in how one moves forward. Thank, Thank you so you much. Thank you so much, Dr. Itsuki, for you know, being very vulnerable with this um, lesson that you had personally taken as well. It was a lesson on both leadership and mm -hmm. failure, if I might add. And actually on that note, you know, as part of your big past results framework, as, your as part of transformational leadership, you also speak about divine intervention as a way to stay humble and remember that at the end of the day, we're not really fully in charge of life. And fundamentally, that vulnerability is a virtue. And, you know, first to also recognize that the world is not at our feet. Um, and to your point, pride is one of the biggest faults in leadership. You've just given a true demonstration of an, a personal failure, personal and professional failure that you've experienced. On that note, how do you also demonstrate vulnerability in your leadership? There are a couple of things. Uh, is that When you meet people and you want to lead them, you must be clear about the true north. But when you are clear about the true north, you will tell them that you do not know the answers to getting there. But you know where you want to go. And that's setting the direction is the key. So when I tell people I don't know all the answers, but I'm going to ask you to run less, so that you and us together we find the answers. And the answers, I believe, are going to come from examining the PNL. And so you notice that the approach that I'm taking, I'm showing vulnerability because I tell them I don't know. But I tell them I know where we're heading. But I do know that the answers will come from us running the labs to discover together the answers to doing that. That's the first thing that you do in terms of vulnerability. But you tell them, look, when we implement these things, I will have a one-third, one-third, one-third rule. That's also showing vulnerability. One third, one third, one third rule means one third of the solutions that we discovered in the lab will be implemented exactly as we envisaged them. One third. Another third will be modified because circumstances out there are different. You know, the competition changed. And so a lot of the customers' views are different. So we will modify the one third. But also showing vulnerability that we don't know it all. The third one, the, the final third, is we didn't even think about those ideas. We didn't think about them at all during the lab. So vulnerability here is to say that I didn't know it in the lab. You didn't know it too. All of us didn't know it. So this one-third, one-third, one-third rule shows vulnerability of leaders, vulnerabilities of the entire team as well. So that tells you the idea of agility. How do I know the one-third, one-third, and one-third. Very simple. We have a weekly tracking. Every week, I have a dashboard, and I put them here, right here. And all the staff carry it. Every Friday, we will know what has been implemented during the week and what has not been. We have a traffic light. Everything that's green, that means it's doing well. It's running as we had envisaged them. All the things red mean it's not working. 
So you know it. Amber means partially working, not quite working. So when it's absolutely consistently red color and you can't solve it, you know it. it's flogging a dead horse. You have to find new solutions. That's the final third. Finding entirely new solutions we didn't even envisage in the lab. And the Ember ones, you find ways to modify. And so every week we are getting into problem solving. So I chaired a meeting where everybody sit down in the room and said, this is what I'm envisaged in the lab. This is working, but this part we need to modify. How do you modify? And this completely do not work. What's the new solution? So we're continuously making adaptation. In the knowledge that we vulnerable in the beginning, not to say that we knew it all. We're not God. So at the beginning, when we run the lab to the best of our ability, that's what we thought was right at that time. But once you done declare in implementation, this is a one-third, one-third, one-third rule. Everybody know we need to adjust and be agile. So agility is a very important aspect of success in implementation. Most people who are rigid implementation fail because they think that the plan is robust and the plan is cast in concrete. And if it doesn't work, they just doggedly pursue that. That's panacea for disaster. You must be prepared to say it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, you have to change it. I use a term here, not many people like this term. So years ago, the thing is that when somebody has a pet project, pet idea, you are in love with the idea. And because you really want to nurture it, it's your idea. And the term here is to kill puppies. Oh, tell us more. <laughs> meaning to say that if you came with that idea and that idea is dead, it doesn't work. You have to kill it. Know when to let go. No, you must learn to let go. Even though how much attached you are to that idea and that idea was yours, you dream about it in the lab, you are told, convinced wow. people. You have to be prepared to say, yeah, I was wrong. So I'm prepared to kill puppy. And it's a term that people don't like to hear. <laughs> you were free from it. But it's the notion of being able to say, I'm no longer emotionally attached to it. Be objective you, as well, right? Yeah, yeah, vulnerable. So vulnerability about it. They said, I'm objective. Although I'm as, uh, attached to it, I must learn to let go. Wow. Dr. Sri, you're certainly, I think in your long career as well, you know, you have, where well, you have done many roles, HR, sales, marketing, upstream, you've certainly gleaned so much insights and gems throughout your career. And, you know, for us on the podcast here, our, list, well, our listeners are primarily young working professionals who are figuring out their whys, their North Stars. I think all of these lessons that you spoke about will be something that will inspire them to think about their careers and prof personal and professional lives very differently. What is one actionable career advice that you can share with our listeners who are, you know, listening to this podcast and they're aspiring to leave a positive impact behind and also thrive in their careers? The one thing is setting the impossible target on your, if you like, your true north. So I would say 90% of human beings get buried underground because we constantly only set ourselves possible target, realistic target. And it means this. If you set realistic target and you only pursue in your whole life realistic target, that means you're never going to realize your full potential. Because our full potential only exists when you pursue the impossible target. So once you continuously lead your life by setting realistic targets year in and year out, you're effectively consigning yourself to a life of mediocrity. So that is the one advice that I will put to young people aspiring to achieve their best, their true potential. Setting for themselves an impossible target. Let me define clearly what is impossible in my call the game of the impossible. The game of the impossible, the term impossible target is defined by me as a target that you cannot achieve based on your current way of doing it, but can be achieved if you find a new way to do it. And so it then forces you to discover what's the new way to do. In my case, I knew that Gordon Bethune the guy from Continental, did it in Continental. It was, he put up an impossible target. The target looked impossible, but the guy did it. So I realized if I went to Malaysia Airlines and did everything that the people were doing there, 
and did exactly what the guys before me were doing. I'm consigning the, the, the airline towards bankruptcy. But I have to find an entirely new way to do it. Then we will get down to doing it. So the one advice for young people is setting for yourself the game of the impossible. It will then force you to transform. That's yeah. really good. I don't know about you, Janice, but That's I really good. need to think of what is my own game of the yeah, impossible. Yeah, absolutely. I have to achieve that. So actually, on that note, what is your most recent game of the impossible target that you're working on? Tell our audience. Well, I, I'm telling you one that you will tell me it's not impossible. Okay. <laughs> because I, for the longest time, but it, for me, it's impossible. The impossible was, I had thought I would have to write a book. For the longest time, I mean more than 30 years, I thought about this idea. I never got around to doing it. And I paused and asked the question, why is it that I'm not able to write this book? And I then said, why don't I put the, the game, The Impossible? It was January. 20 years I didn't write it, but let me write the manuscript and finish it by October this year. Mm, 10 months. So I said, well, if I write my full story and write this in a, in compendium and detailed stuff that we're talking today in this book. And if I do it in 10 months, and if I do it the old way of doing it, I will never achieve. So I found a new way to do it. So I hired a co-writer. So I brought him. And we said, I look, Guna, Guna is his name. So Guna, can you come to my house at 9 o'clock every Thursday? So the new way of working is I spend a, one hour telling you about what are we going to do for this chapter. So after we finish that hour, you go back and write it. I will also write my version of that chapter based on what I've told you and based on things I, I haven't even told you. When I finish doing that, I pass my draft to you. You put the, put the two together. That's how we do the core writing. But I found that very good. So are we on schedule? We will finish the manuscript by the end of October. Mm, right. Stay yeah, so, tuned, everyone. So Guna Heard it here and first. Dr. Idris, we look forward to <laughs> yeah. that book and hearing more yeah. about it. Yeah. But it will take time to get publishers and mm. do all other things. That, that was a, but the key here was that mm. there was an impossible target, setting the date when we we're going to finish the manuscript and really setting ourselves the discipline of writing the chapters every Thursday, really going down to a routine of doing that. So everything in life is, a, if, if you like, is a trade-off. By doing that, they were, I have to sacrifice many other things. So on Thursday morning, I knew that is the time that I'm going to allocate for doing this. That means I can't have meetings with my client. I can't meet I just have to dedicate doing that. So I'm curious to know, just a very quick, you know, double down on that. When it comes to you finding new ways of working, did you have to experiment a little bit before you found out that, you know, what you actually needed and the new way of working is bringing in a co-writer? But did you have several experimentations because, you know, presumably you don't know this new way of working is what you actually needed to get you started on the book. Yeah. I tried a couple of ideas to do it, but I really couldn't uh, get down to doing it. So I sat down uh, like everybody else, figured out what is it that I'm going to do differently. Then I met some other people who hired ghost writers to do this. But I didn't want that because, you know, the, the ghost writer idea is that the guy who writes the book is unknown. Nobody knows it's invisible. I didn't. So when I, I suggested, if I brought someone to come to do this, I want that person to have the accolade as well. So the idea of being co-writing is very important, giving him also the avenue of saying, yeah, I'm also on the pedestal, much the same as me. So his name will be on the book, same as mine. So we split the proceeds for any sales of the book. So, I mean, the idea of co-writing, bringing uh, the enthusiasm for that person because then the credit also mm. goes to him. And it's well. also ownership. Ownership. Yeah. So together. I think it, together we're journeying this together. So the routine we have in the, in the house is he comes there, I provide nasi lemak. Lah. So we have nasi lemak and the, we, we do that. And sometimes we, we order some food, grab food and uh, dim sum. And wow. we also have... Starting Thursday <laughs> mornings, and, uh, right. I love so it. So very nice. So when mm. we do that, we do that. Then we have the chat. Make it fun as fun well, right? You know, yeah. That's the routine. All mm. right. That's the street. We, you know, we, one of the things that we do as well is that we pitched out to our audience for an opportunity for them to ask you a question. So that we have a question here from one of our listeners, um, Chin Yu Sin by the name. So his question, and I'll read it out verbatim, is, Dato Sri, could you share insights from your experience advocating for situational leadership 
for business transformation and specifically during the initial transformation stages when the directive style mm. of leadership is applied. What so have you encountered resistance from mm. leaders who were accustomed to a different approach? And if so, how did you effectively overcome their resistance and guide them through their shift? Thank you very much for this question. Uh, Chin, uh, this question is a wonderful one because we didn't cover it in our chat early on. This idea of situational leadership uh, is not my original idea. It's the Ken Blanchard idea. Ken Blanchard, if you Google, you'll find out Ken Blanchard believes that every journey goes through a four phase. First phase is orientation phase when you, as the leader, you tell them you're going to do this. This is what we tell to do. This is true north. This is the game, the impossible. Then when people are gathered inside the lab to implement, at that time there was a lot of excitement. You get down to implementing it. That's called phase two. Phase two is what is called dissatisfaction phase. That means you're going to break down the status quo. People are going to resist. There's no breakthrough without breakdown. In my terminology, if you say I'm going to do business as usual, everything is the way in which you do it, you never break through. So you have to really go through a period when you're going to break down the status quo, the tremendous resistance. At that point, the the leadership style in situational leadership is directive. Telling people we will run lab. This is what we're going to do. I'm directing you. This is the PNL. I want everybody to come there because I'm not I'm not going to tell them, oh no, no, can we do it any other way? No, no, no. I'm telling you we run it lab. This is the way we're going to do this it. This is going to, going mm. to do it. It can't be any other way. I'm going to put the PNL for you to do it. The CFO can't tell me it is we don't have to do the segmented PNL by 110,000. We need to only do it by root. I said, no, this is how we will do it. So that is this idea of being directive. The phase three and phase four is phase three is resolution phase in the implementation. Then people begin to solve problem. They know how to do it and their competency will rise. At this point, what you will then as a leader need to do you change your repertoire from being a directive leader in style to become more empowering. Because they now already know what to do. And perhaps by that time, some of them even know more about what to do than you do. So if you keep on telling them what to do, chances are you may get it wrong and they get it right. There's going to be a lot of tension between that. The final phase is called the production phase. That means they really know how to solve the problem. They really know how to journey onwards towards the, the, the promised land. And they don't really need you. That's the time you learn to learn to let go. That means truly empowering, truly allowing leaders to grow, truly making yourself redundant. The best leaders are the ones that make themselves redundant. That means letting others grow. So in the Bible, the story about Moses, when Moses took his people, from Egypt on the exodus towards the promised land. First phase, everybody believed him. He was being directive. Do you think Moses had democratic discussion <laughs> with his people? He would be stuck there for a hundred years. He never <laughs> left because he had no GPS. There's no map. But he says, this is where we're going. This is the land of milk and honey called the promised land. Believe me, they look at him, they became convinced. But when they followed him, they got very pissed off with him because 40 years in the desert, they were, they, we should, yeah, we, they said we should have died in Egypt. There's no point for us to be stuck here. The, the period of distraction. Phase three and four, Moses never really led people to, to the promised land. It was Joshua that did. So you notice his approach now, learning to let go, learning to empower. So in most of us who have kids, we understand this when kids are babies and they're crawling. At that time, you don't go and tell them you are empowered to go to the kitchen. They are full of knives, the fireplace. They please do as you please. You can't. So what you need to do is use the word no and don't. So when people are at that period when they are in your directive style, the approach is this. Your directive of what you want them to do. But the area where you cannot tell them what to do, you provide constraints. That means these are the things, the boundary conditions. I don't want you to do the following things. Within the boundary conditions, you're free to act. For example, I said, I give you a budget. Don't bust this budget. 
and you can do this, you can do within this amount of budget, this target, but I'm not really going to tell you how to do it. So in the directive mode, you're very directive about where we're heading. You directive about the targets, the impossible targets. You directing them about the method of multiple oper operandi such as a lab. But once you are then giving them the boundary conditions, then you said within that sphere of the boundary conditions, you have the freedom to act. But that freedom to act small. In the phase three and four, then the boundary conditions are large outside. They have a lot more freedom to act. In the fourth phase, there are very little boundary conditions. You just have the target and you tell the guy, I'm not giving you any conditions, boundary conditions. You know what to do. You go and chase them. So the best part when you're in leadership is when you led your team towards phase four, then you just play guitar and play golf <laughs> and go fishing la, because they know what to do. Yeah. Then you become redundant. Which is it's, something we know you keep yourself busy with. <laughs> yeah. So on, on that note, it sounds like transformational leadership does require you to, as a leader, to also look at the situation and adapt your leadership style according to the phases of which the situation is at, right? Whether it's at the early stages, midpoint, or the final stage where you can relax and watch your people be able to run the show. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. make me put the point, you hit the nail on the head. You should not be thinking about changing your leadership style based on your ego. You only adjust your leadership style based on the team development. How do you know the team have developed by the weekly monitoring results? Every week, we monitor the result. And when you reach week after week, you know the results are accrued. You know the team's doing You know they, they figured it out. So not, not just by some esoteric thing that I said, one year I need to do this and the subsequent year. No, no, no. You look at it week by week. And week by week, if you know they are able to achieve the results and they know what to do, then you know they are competent. So it is adjusting your leadership repertoire based on the team development and the team development is monitored on the basis of the weekly results delivery. So tracking via yeah. a very tangible... Very tangible. Report. That's really good. One final question, Dr. Suri, that we do like to ask our guests at the end of every episode and the question we have for you today is what is one thing that you would like to explore more of? <laughs> you, like me, what yes, to explore? What would you like to explore more of? I think what you should think about doing is that how do you ex move this idea of explore to a target that's truly global and that you never Im imagine? For Put us. yourself the game. Uh -huh. For yourself. Uh -huh. That's our game of the And game. I'm oh. posing it to you. Oh. <laughs> the, that's very nice. The word act means act. That means action. Explore means figure it out. Journey it together. So the idea is learning by doing. So I have a very simple idea. I always believe there are two schools of thought in transformation. The first school of thought is the, the school where people believe that if you change the being, then the results will accrue. There's another school of thought that says if you change the doing, the action of changing the, the doing will eventually shape the being then you achieve the results. Now, both schools of thought are correct. But one is slow, one is fast. The one that, in my view, that gets you big, fast results is the one that stand in the school of doing rather than the school of being. And i give you a very simple example. If I were to ask you, how do you learn to ride a bicycle? If I ask you, let's, you go to the school of being to ride a bicycle, you're going to go through, you do a bachelor degree in physics, uh, physics of motion, a master's degree and PhD. Seven years later, you have a PhD in the physics of motion. Then but I, I might not you, know how to cycle. You would not know how to cycle, I assure you. Yeah. But if I now say to you, I said, I'm not sending you to the school of being, I'm going to send you to the school of doing, you don't go and do your degree, and physics and your bachelor degree and a master's, I just give you a bicycle. You go and ride the bicycle, you fall down a few times, suddenly your car comes in. You figured it out. But if I ask you, Janice, you said, you now know how to ride this bicycle. 
can you explain in theory to Sarah Ann now she knows how to write it. You cannot teach it. So this idea of really doing it is the one that shapes it. In everything that I talked about, I begin with this idea of act. The doing. And then the exploring is the one that you make the change here. Then this is the thing that causes you to explore in the lab to find out a way how to figure it out. But so it's a nice idea. So how do you put this and become a, a global phenomenon? That's your game, the impossible. Uh. Wow, so much wow. to think about today, yeah. Sarah. Lots of doing. Yeah, lots of learning by doing, right? Yeah, learning by doing. Rather than having these just mull in your head like good ideas that never eventually fusion. Yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. on that note, any final words that you might have for our audience? Well, there's one idea that I thought, not quite final, but it's very important idea. Yeah. This idea of trade-off. Because, you know, when I talk about True North, the True North, I made the mention that ruthless prioritization is important. But people ask me, it is, he said, but, you know, in life, uh, life is so complex. We have many types of issues. But I beg to differ, actually. There are only two types of issues in, in the world. Only two. The one is problem to be solved. The other one is polarities to be managed. And let me define what that means in a simple idea for customer. Suppose I sell to you a product. You're the customer. Then you complain to me that this product is faulty. This product is, you know, it doesn't open. You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. No sound is coming from it. So what is my, pro that's a problem to be solved. How do I solve the problem? Give you a new product. Alternatively, repair it. That's a problem to be solved. There's no question about it. Another one is polarity to be managed. That means you really cannot solve the problem. It's a trade-off. Take the example. I'm, I sell to you a product. The customer will always have a polarity. The polarity that the customer have for every product I sell, the polarity is between price and quality. You would want lowest price, but you want the highest quality. quality yeah. That's what everybody wants. But I cannot, I cannot do that. That's not possible. So in life, if I want to please you, I need to really understand exactly what makes you tick. And if I understand what makes you tick, I can then find a way I call the sweet spot. I give you a price that you will now accept because based on that quality. Let me give a real practical example like that one I gave earlier on. We used to fly our flights from Kuala Lumpur to Hong Kong. And we were giving them on the business class very nice meal, bringing the, the, the folks that fly to Hong Kong for breakfast, like very expensive, continental mean they have everything there. But it was costly. We found that they didn't really like it. The customer survey from that sector, they didn't really like it. It was costly. So first, it was costly. At the second time, there's, there's, there's not enough satisfaction. So when we tried to look for what is it they really want in that sector, what do they want? They want congee. Mm. Porridge. What is Comfort congee? <laughs> Very cheap stuff. Yeah. You put some chicken there and you put porridge. It costs you next to nothing. A fraction of the continental breakfast. And high satisfaction. High satisfaction. Wow. But try and give that congee for the routes that flight from Sydney all the way to Kuala Lumpur. They'll kill you because that's terrible for the Aussies. Yeah. They don't want that. So the idea here is that if you understand the customer segment and you look at the polarity between price at the same time, the quality, you will find the sweet spot. But you must customize. The sector to Sydney and Adelaide Completely different customer behavior compared to the one to Taiwan to Hong Kong. And so if you are only a guy that says, I want to standardize every offering, you will never find the sweet spot, the trade-off. So I believe that every marketing people, every sales people, when they want to sell a product, a service, might begin by doing a very simple template. Template number one, what is the target customer? Describe them. Target number two. What's the unique customer value proposition? That means I'm giving to this customer exactly this, exactly that, exactly this. The third one, very important, what's the trade-off? What I'm not giving to that customer? 
you must make it very clear if you buy my product, I'm not giving you this, I'm not giving you this, I'm not giving you this. Because I know that customer segment want this and this and that. Because I'm doing that, I can lower my cost. My price can then be lower because I'm not giving them what they don't need. Because I know the customer want this, I'm giving them what they want, but I'm not giving what they don't want. That's customization. Only when you do that, then you determine the price. Then you say, I now say I'm giving this in my product to the customer. I'm not giving this. Therefore, I can peg then the price. And if the price is right, they will buy it because they now value this. Do not give to the customer what they don't value. The only way you can do that, be clear about your target customer that you are targeting. And if you don't know how to do this, you're going to produce products that are not going to deal with the trade-off. And so I do believe in life. And this is very important. And uh, I would say today, bring another example on polarity to be managed. You know, husband and wife, for example, you may find they have habits. They may find habits. Maybe the husband is a very, uh, it's a guy that uh, likes to, uh, to do many things that are uh, planning. Or the wife may want to plan, but the husband doesn't like to plan. And he's dirty. He comes back from, from the office. He puts his socks everywhere. And the wife is very tidy and wants everything there. But if the two of them try to argue this kind of thing, they're probably divorced. So life is about making one understand that there are certain things you can't change. And that's why people who are obese, for example, they have very difficulty, big difficulty of trimming down. Because habit stays. And so many things that are habitual, they become part of polarity. They're very difficult to kick out. And so if you are, uh, to me, I always tell people, every time you find an issue, you must take this issue and ask the question, is it a problem to be solved or is it polarity to be managed? If you file everything into one folder called the problem to be solved, you end up being a very miserable person. Because for every issue you want to solve, Actually, you can't solve every issue. You have to trade off. You have to give up certain things. Concessions are very important. Trade-offs are important. Finding the sweet spot. Compromises is important. So if you live your life thinking that everything must be filed into one folder called problem to be solved, you will live a very miserable life. And so you must always know which folder to put and what's the kind of solutions that you're going to, to deal with this. I know this is very philosophical. But I find this is a very important way to deal with day-to-day -day life. And I love how what you a, gave a professional mm. example as well as bringing it to life into, you know, personal yeah. and it's something relatable for all of us as well. Yeah, what a wonderful way to end this episode as well. And a, an example that is so relevant personally and professionally. So once again, uh, Dato Sri, we just want to thank you for your time on the Explore This podcast today. We hope that this conversation will bring all of you immense value. We know it definitely benefited us. So thank you so thank much you. for your time, Dr. Pleasure. Chief. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you. you. If you stuck around to the end of this episode, we want to say thank you for exploring with us. And if you don't already, please follow us on Spotify, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating and review, and most importantly, share this episode with your friends. We'd love to hear from you. So you can also connect with us on Instagram using the Instagram handle Explore This Podcast. A-C-T-S-P-L-O-R-E This Podcast. New episodes for Explore This drops every alternate Mondays at 8pm. See you then!